My name is Jody, um, and I'm going to be um, facilitating today with uh, with Roselle. We're the Thika volunteers here um, today. Um, so the title of the session again, it's 232, um, and it's thyroid cancer imaging update, ultrasound, CT, MRI, whole body scan, or PET CT. Um, so Dr. Robert Flavel is here with us. He is an uh, associate professor in the section of uh, molecular imaging in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Flavel is the chief of the of the Division of Molecular Imaging and Therapeutics, uh, formerly Nuclear Medicine, in the Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging. Dr. Flavel's laboratory focuses on the development of new molecular imaging and therapeutic tools for better understanding of disease progression in patients with um, prostate and other cancers. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Flavel. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm honored to speak to this audience. It's my first time participating in this meeting. Um, and I've got an exciting topic to speak about, and it's a really kind of a broad one, and in some sense, a difficult one to speak on because imaging is very important in thyroid cancer, but it's also very diverse, meaning there's so many different tools available um, to, to image patients. And um, so there's so many different circumstances um, in which a different imaging test might be used that it's really just kind of a broad topic to go through. I do cover our um, thyroid tumor board at UCSF from the radiology standpoint. And I'll tell you when I do cover that, any, any type of imaging is on the table. It might be an ultrasound, a CT, an MRI, you know, iodine scan or, or PET CT. So I'm definitely um, familiar with all these, uh, these imaging modalities and, um, and happy to tell you about uh, my opinions on them. So um, I think probably most of the people uh, on this call are familiar with the, the radiology department in general, but you know, we really do have a, a wide variety of things that may happen inside the radiology department. So, and I've just got a few little snapshots, might be things similar to you know, what you might even see on television or something. Um, so here's a, on the top left part of the screen here is a, you know, an interventional procedure being performed by colleagues in the Department of uh, Interventional Radiology inside of, a, inside of a CT scanner. So um, here's an example of a, one of my colleagues looking at a mammogram on, a, on an imaging station. Uh, here's an example of reviewing um, some uh, complex vascular uh, imaging uh, together at a, at a view station. Here's an example of a more advanced imaging method, a fused PET MRI looking at a brain tumor. And here's an example of looking at a PET CT together on a, on a monitor with uh, various colleagues in the department. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these screens are the ones that the patients don't see, which is kind of what happens in the back end where we're kind of reviewing the scans, uh, considering patient's history, looking at the imaging, and then kind of generating our report and, and discussing with our referring physicians. Now, broadly speaking, radiology is an integral part of modern medicine. And over the years, it has kind of gradually increased as technology increases um, because it's uh, very powerful for looking inside the human body. Um, in no area is this more important than in oncology. And, you know, broadly speaking, and you know, in our, probably in our department, something like half of the scans overall that are done are for patients with cancer, um, not just thyroid cancer, but of course across the spectrum, different types of cancer. And it's very powerful because it allows us to see inside the body, detect abnormalities, underlying symptoms and diseases, and lets us monitor responses to treatments. Of course, very important in patients with cancer, you know, is the treatment working? Can we tell if it's getting better? Should we choose a different treatment instead? So for today's lecture, I've broken it up into a few different sections. So first, we're gonna review the development of oncologic imaging. I've got a little bit of a historical perspective to it. Um, illustrate kind of the key differences between what I would call structural imaging, which is ultrasound, CT, and MRI, versus functional imaging, which is nuclear medicine or, or whole body scan and PET. And we'll describe the role of imaging and how it can change care in patients with thyroid cancer. In other words, why is a certain type of scan useful in a certain situation? 
And then finally, I'll wrap up with a section about when to use which test. Now, it's going to be impossible to cover every single scenario here because, uh, you know, as I mentioned already, every patient is different um, and sometimes it's not very clear. Um, but there's kind of broad trends that I can highlight for the more common indications and kind of some rules of thumbs to use. Okay, so let's start out looking at, at some of the basics. So X-ray and CT. So how do these techniques work? Well, essentially what you do is you have an X-ray tube that uh, fires a beam through a patient and it gets stopped by areas of density. So what, what does that look like? Well, areas that are less dense look dark. So here's an example of a, a, a chest X-ray and type of image that you know, many of you may be familiar with. So areas that are less dense like the lungs look dark and areas that are more dense like the bones look white. Um, of course, what we're looking for here then is differences in tissue density. This is an example of a, a patient that has uh, some masses in their lungs, um, probably lung metastases in this case. And you can see, um, you know, chest x-rays are nice uh, and x-rays in general are a nice technique because they're inexpensive, they're fast. Um, but I mean, in, in some sense, they're very limited for oncology imaging. In fact, these were originally invented in the 1920s. Um, and while they're a good frontline uh, test for kind of screening things, they're really not used that much for kind of standard follow-up of, of cancers, broadly speaking. Now, a more advanced version of x-rays was invented in the, in the 1970s and developed in the 80s and, you know, continues to even develop today. And this is called the CT scan. So what this is, is now instead of having a one beam kind of passing through a patient and being detected on the other side, you now have a beam that rotates around the patient and provides a three-dimensional view inside the tissues. Um, so this is very powerful because it gives you much higher spatial and anatomic resolution. So it let, lets us see, um, you know, these, again, it's the same basic principle. We're looking at areas of different tissue density, but now we're able to see it in much greater detail. And so here's an example of a, a CT scan through the chest. Kind of similar, kind of similar overall scenario to the chest X-ray on the left, but now we're seeing things in much greater detail. We can see the spot over here in the in the right lung, um, and this is a regular looking nodule. This is a typical look uh, for lung cancer, and you can see again, kind of the tissues are different in terms of their density, right? The lung is looking less dense and black, kind of these soft tissues in the chest wall looking kind of intermediate density, and then the the bones appearing white. Now, more relevant to, to thyroid cancer is, is CT scanning um, of the neck and chest. Um, this is something that's done pretty frequently in this patient population. Um, this is uh, over here on the right is an example of a contrast enhanced CT of the neck. Uh, contrast is nice for CT scanning and for MRI as well, because it gives us better definition of that soft tissues in between. You know, as you can tell from the, the CT scan, it's pretty easy to tell apart, you know, lung and bone and things like that. But then once you start to look at different soft tissue densities, for example, the, the findings can become more subtle and that's where contrast comes in. So broadly speaking, um, contrast can help uh, for oncologic imaging. We do like to use it for thyroid cancer in general. The, the one trick that can sometimes come in for thyroid cancer is that the, the contrast can interfere with radioactive iodine scans and treatment. So if a patient is you know, going to undergo a uh, radioactive iodine scan or treatment in the near future, we discourage it. But other than that, probably a lot of the scans could be done with contrast. So what do we see on this image? Well, we've got the um, we've got this uh, irregular appearing thyroid mass, and then we've got a, a lymph node here uh, next to it in the in the right central neck, you know, consistent with a lymph node metastasis. Now, um, ultrasound and MRI are, are very powerful techniques as well. And, and I would say, you know, if I had to choose, probably the king of thyroid cancer imaging uh, these days is the ultrasound. Uh, and the reason for that is because it is relatively inexpensive, it's accurate, and it doesn't involve any radiation. And one important thing to consider for imaging is the use of ionizing radiation or not. So um, the concept of radiation doses is, is a somewhat controversial one. Um, and I don't think there's any great answer in the long run as to whether, you know, the, the, um, the types of doses of radiation that we give in medical imaging, like CT or PET scanning, that kind of thing, if they really do have a long-term detrimental effect to patients. But all that being said, if we have a choice, we would probably prefer to use a test that does not use ionizing radiation, if it's at least equivalent to the test that uses radiation. 
So um, ultrasound was kind of developed in the 80s and 90s and kind of emerged into the standard of care in the 2000s. Ultrasound continues to improve with the advances in technology. And ultrasound is really fantastic at looking at the thyroid gland itself. Um, it's uh, used as a upfront screening test for characterization of nodules. You know, if there's an abnormal nodule, thyroid is pro or, uh, thyroid ultrasound is probably the best test to characterize it. Um, may at least be able to stratify if a nodule needs a biopsy or not. Ultrasound's also very good for looking at uh, for sites of disease recurrence after surgery. Uh, can pick up small uh, sites in the thyroid bed or small lymph node metastases in the neck. Um, so over here on the left, we have an example of a, a thyroid, a large thyroid nodule uh, in the gland. So could be a could be a papillary thyroid cancer, for example, and that's what what it is in this case. Um, what else was I going to say about ultrasound? I had something else in mind. I'm sure I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, but yeah, just to summarize, ultrasound really great test, frontline imaging modality for for thyroid cancer. Uh, it's uh, great for looking at tissue neck. Oh, I remember what I was going to say. So one, th one important thing to consider about ultrasound is uh, ultrasound is not always the same. There's a great inter-operator inter variability in the use of ultrasound. So um, really, you know, the ultrasound is such a cheap instrument that essentially anyone can put one in their office and start scanning. Um, but I would say the, the quality of the scans varies dramatically. Um, so I think there's a big difference in ultrasound when it's performed in the hands of an expert operator at, you know, high volume institution versus a less expert operator. Um, okay, so next imaging modality, which probably is a little less frequently on thyroid cancer, but it is also one to consider is magnetic resonance imaging. So this technology that kind of came out in the 90s and also continues to increase today. Magnetic resonance imaging does not use uh, ionizing radiation, so it's nice from that standpoint. And it characterizes the magnetic properties of the tissue. Um, is it able to, it's, and one of the nice things about MRI is compared to CT, it broadly speaking, it, it is better able to characterize differences in soft tissues. So, um, and that's nice for thyroid cancer, particularly in the neck. Um, so here's an example where you can see this um, thyroid cancer here uh, in, the, in the right thyroid nodule. And one thing that also people tend to get confused about is the way to think about these, these tomographic scans like CT and MRI is always think that the patient is facing you with their feet kind of projecting out of the screen. So that's it. So the right and left is kind of flipped on the image versus what it is on the person. So although this nodule here is, it looks like it's on the left part of the image, it's actually on the right side of the patient. So, um, so yeah, here's this uh, thyroid nodule. And again, this is a papillary thyroid cancer. Okay. And so, you know, the parts that, again, that uh, just to kind of highlight for these structural imaging modalities, so the parts that you, uh, you know, you may see as the patient is here at the start, uh, you know, you go to the, go to the radiology clinic, get the scan done. There is the step that happens here in between um, where, you know, the, us as the radiologists review these images and, and conduct the report, um, consider the history, and then, you know, in some cases, uh, contact directly with the referring physician. In most cases, this is relatively invisible to patients. But just to let you know, we are we are working um, hard behind the scenes um, on your behalf. And then, of course, the the part um, that you be familiar with is when you review these results with your physician. These days, one thing is one major change that may have happened um, if you've had a scan recently is because of uh, changes in the um, in the uh, uh, in uh, legal requirements. Scan results are being often being released directly to patients. Um, you know, through electronic applications before they've even had a chance to reach their uh, before they've had a chance to discuss with their physician. So that's been an interesting change for us in the field of radiology. And we're not not totally sure what to do with how, what to exactly to do with that yet. Now that we're almost, you know, directly releasing our results to patients without having that kind of referring physician as a, the conduit. OK, so let's talk a little bit about structural versus functional imaging. So the imaging modalities I showed you so far have common features. Specifically, they see alterations in tissue structure. So we're looking at soft tissue densities. Now, in some cases, changes in metabolism or tissue function can come before gross alterations in tissue structure. So in other words, fundamentally, what we're looking for in CT ultrasound MRI is, you know, is there a mass? Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Um, but sometimes the changes in metabolism or tissue function can help uh, characterize masses, 
or uh, tell you more about what they're doing in response to treatment before that alteration in tissue structure comes up. Um, so for that reason, metabolic and functional imaging can be more sensitive for detecting or following response to treatment in cancer. And in thyroid cancer, we have two main versions of this, this functional type of imaging. The first is uh, iodine scanning or whole body scan um, with iodine-123 or iodine-131. And the second is PET scanning, usually with FDG PET. And this is commonly used in thyroid cancer to detect and characterize the disease. So let's talk a little bit about radioactive iodine imaging. I know there's separate sessions about radioactive iodine therapy, so I'm not gonna go over that in detail, although I'd be happy to ask, answer questions about that at the end as well, because you know I'm, I'm, I also um, do radioactive iodine treatments in my practice. So the major function of the thyroid gland is to make thyroid hormone. And this sets the metabolic rate for many essential functions. The thyroid uses iodine as essential element for making T3 and T4, which is the different types of thyroid hormone. So well-differentiated papillary and follicular thyroid cancers in particular retain this property. So they take up a lot of the, the iodine. And so what that means is that tracer doses of radioactive iodine can be used for imaging and treatment of these thyroid cancers. Now, however, note is not true for all types of thyroid cancer. So for example, medullary thyroid cancer, anaplastic, and some um, poorly differentiated or rare thyroid cancer types do not take up radioactive iodine so that this type of imaging should not be used in those patient populations. So um, I'm kind of, I have a little bit of a, I'm a little bit of a history uh, buff in terms of medical history and otherwise, but it's interesting to note that radioactive iodine was actually first performed in the, in the 1940s um, and uh, remains part of the standard of care today. And here's an example of how imaging was used even in the, these, this first report from the Journal of the Medical, a Journal of the American Medical Association from 1946. Um, so you can see here in this, this one of the, the first patients to ever get radioactive iodine, you can see here's what their pelvis looked like originally in uh, image A. In image B, you can see this big chunk of it got removed by a, by a um, thyroid cancer metastasis. The patient got some radioactive iodine and then the kind of the metastasis became treated and some of that bone was able to grow back afterwards. But in, the, in these early days, the, the radioactive iodine treatment could be done, but the technology to image it had not yet been invented. In fact, that didn't come out until the 60s or the 70s. But nowadays, when we do treatments with radioactive iodine or the whole body scan, we are able to image it. Um, and the technology we use for it, it's called uh, a gamma camera. Um, and essentially what this is, is this uh, detects photons that are emitted from inside the patient. So the patient typically swallows a pill of, of uh, radioactive iodine, iodine-123 or 131, um, waits a little while for the, the, um, the iodine to distribute in the tissues, usually about 24 hours for a, for a iodine-123 scan and typically longer for an iodine-131 scan. And then these uh, gamma camera whole body scan is, is obtained. So here's a typical exam of what, what a normal appearance might look like after thyroidectomy. So uh, here's the whole body scan. So uh, we typically see uptake in the regions of the salivary glands. We see uptake typically in the stomach, uh, and then it kind of clears on uh, more distally into the bowel. And then we also see some uptake in the bladder. And what we always see is some uptake in the thyroid remnant. Now, there's, you know, it's impossible for the surgeons to remove every last cell of the thyroid when they take out, take out the, when they perform their surgery. Um, so we always see some amount of thyroid remnant. Um, so it's, it never goes down to zero, uh, at least after the first um, surgery and, and radioactive iodine. So here's some other examples of what a whole body scan might look like. Um, so here's a whole body scan. Uh, we have this, um, this uh, thyroid remnant, again, kind of in the midline neck. And then we have an additional spot down below that. So what would that be? So in this case, it would turn out to be a, a lymph node metastasis in the upper mediastinum. And you know, one of the values of the radioactive iodine imaging is to help detect those additional sites of, of radioactive iodine avid metastatic disease. So lymph nodes, lungs, that kind of thing. One thing that was invented more recently was, and, uh, and is now pr probably standard at most in institutions is the use of SPECT and SPECT-CT. So remember how I was saying about how the CT scan kind of rotates around the patient and gets you better information about about x-ray imaging. 
Well, SPECT is kind of the, the CT of, of nuclear medicine, if you will, or of the whole body scan. So essentially what you do now is you take your gamma camera and you rotate it around the patient and you can then reconstruct it um, to generate a 3D map of where the radioactive iodine has localized. Even better, now what most places do, will they will fuse it on top of a CT scan. So now we kind of get the best of both worlds. We can see the anatomy and the localization with the CT scan, and then we put the iodine uh, scan on top of that so we can get both the function and the structure in a single exam. So here's an example of how um, spec CT uh, can be useful. So um, this is uh, you know the, the kind of the whole body scan picture here in the top left. You see two spots in the neck. Tough to know too much about what to make of that. You know, if the patient just had their surgery, this could just be a thyroid remnant. Um, but then when you do the SPECT CT, we see that these are two different spots. One of these here in, uh, that's shown here in letter D is right there in the central thyroid bed. So in fact, now we know that that's just the thyroid remnant, that's normal. Um, but this other one labeled B here is actually outside the thyroid bed. And in fact, it corresponds with the tiny lymph node. So now we know that this patient has a small lymph node metastasis. And that may help us uh, change our management um, in terms of planning our radioactive iodine treatment or uh, even other types of treatment. And in general, um, SPECT CT is not available everywhere, but uh, my opinion is that um, radioactive iodine imaging should be performed with SPECT when it is available. Um, so that's uh, radioactive iodine imaging. Now, there's more metabolic things that change in cancer. In fact, the metabolism of cancer is incredibly complicated and that's how it, you know, cancer comes to exist and survive inside of our body. So cancer cells have profound alterations in metabolism that let them su survive in an organism that would like to destroy them. So one of the most well-known changes in, in cancer metabolism is called the Warburg effect after Otto Warburg. And that's the picture of Otto Warburg. As I mentioned, I'm kind of interested in medical history and things like that. Um, and the, the direct quote here is that cancer, above all other diseases, has countless secondary causes. But even for cancer, there is only one prime cause. Summarized in a few words, the prime cause of cancer is the replacement of the respiration of oxygen in the normal body cells by a fermentation of sugar. So what this means is that cancer often has a metabolic switch where it moves away from the oxidative phosphorylation and respiration to, towards the fermentation of sugar. And this effect has been known about for, for many years. And these, these were uh, discoveries from, I believe, from pre-World War II. Um, and over the years, we've kind of harnessed different ways to detect this. And one of these that came, came about uh, in the 80s and 90s and, and more recently today is the use of FDG PET scanning or fluorodeoxyglucose. So glucose is this molecule over here on the left side. It's, you know, it's the one we get in all of our foods. So how would you image that? Well, we have a special trick that we use for it is we convert this hydroxyl group here at the two position to a fluoride atom and change it into fluorodeoxyglucose. And then the second thing we do is we make that into a radioactive fluorine or F8 using F18. So F18 is a, a, pos is a radioactive um, element that emits positrons. These positrons can be picked up in special scanners called PET scanners. So how does that work? So the, the PET scanner in some ways is like kind of a more advanced version of a gamma camera. So, um, so positrons do, um, that, that, that are emitted by F18 do something special, which is that they are, they're kind of a form of antimatter, in fact. So they, they travel a short distance in tissue and they hit their opposite particle, which is the electron. So positron, electron, those are antiparticles. Those two particles annihilate, and then they produce two 511 keV photons. And the special thing about these 511 keV photons is that they travel exactly 180 degrees apart from each other. It's just the underlying physics. Um, it, it's just a special property of this type of annihilation. So the nice thing about that is you know that these two photons are traveling exactly opposite from each other. So now you have a special set of advanced detectors that are in a ring around the patient, and you detect these simultaneous double, fo double photons. And then a bunch of um, advanced reconstruction happens in the background, and you can use that to um, detect the distribution of the, of the glucose. And these days, um, PET scanning is often also fused with CT scanning. You can also do it with MRI as well, although CT is by far the most popular choice in this situation. And then you generate these types of scans. So over here on the left, we have a, a PET CT scan. You've got the CT scan here on the left, 
we got the pet part in the middle and then we've got the fusion image on top where you've put the color map of the pet on top of the ct scan so again here you kind of get the best of both worlds you get the ct scan to get you that anatomic information to let you know where the abnormal metabolic signal is and then the pet is useful for um for detecting that those sites of abnormal metabolism and then in many ways is very similar to the radio iodine spec ct that i showed you earlier but then of course in that case we're looking at the iodine metabolism rather than the glucose metabolism. So let's let's look a little bit about how these these may be useful for patients. So here's a, a classic case example: 35 year old woman with metastatic papillary thyroid cancer, um, unfortunate but very common case. Patient underwent an iodine 123 whole body scan. You can see over here on the left side of the screen, we've got a few sites of uptake in the neck. Probably these ones in the middle are more thyroid bed uptake, but more out, out laterally, we have um, probably some lymph node metastases. And then we've got this, unfortunately, this diffuse uptake in the lungs consistent with lung metastases. Now on the whole, now on the um, FDG PET scan, it actually looks nice and clean. We don't see any uptake in that, that thyroid bed. We don't see any uptake in the lungs. So that's a normal scan. And so what this is, this tells us this is a good kind of cancer. We have, um, a lot of uptake of the radioactive iodine and not much uptake in the glucose. So this is a, the patient who's kind of the ideal candidate to be treated with radioactive iodine therapy because we know from the scan that, they're, that their cancer is really hungry for the iodine. Now, what about the other side of the coin, which is tumor dedifferentiation? So here's a 45-year-old man with a history of metastatic papillary thyroid cancer. This patient underwent a FDG PET-CT, and here we see a ton of uptake in a, uh, in a lung nodule here, right by the, uh, right by the hilum. Very hot, we use this SUV max parameter, it measures 28.6. So really bright, very uh, FDG avid, very glucose hungry metastasis. This patient's whole body iodine 131 scan was negative. So what does that mean? So this is, this suggests that the tumor here is de-differentiated. This is associated with poor treatment response and poor prognosis, unfortunately for this patient. And um, this is something called um, the flip-flop phenomenon that's been known about for some time, where there's a rough inverse correlation of FDG uptake and iodine uptake with iodine-123 or, or other agents. Um, and um, these uh, um, differentiated tumors, like the, like the one I showed you first, the young woman with the diffuse lung mats, um, these uh, well-differentiated tumors resemble the normal underlying uh, tissues and they uh, take up the iodine-131. Whereas on the other hand, we have the, uh, the poorly differentiated tumors with a lot of the glucose uptake and um, less of the radioactive iodine treatment. So here on one end, we have the poorly differentiated tumors, which have an aggressive phenotype and are resistive, resistant to radioactive iodine treatment. A lot of FDG uptake, not much iodine uptake. On the other hand, we have the well-differentiated tumors with a more, typically a more indolent phenotype, which are more amenable to iodine-131 treatment. They have a lot of radioactive iodine uptake and not much FDG uptake. So to spend a good amount of time going through the different imaging modalities. Um, so the key distinction here is structural versus functional imaging. Let's review the best, best use cases for these different types of imaging. So ultrasound is great for thyroid nodules and assessment for lymph nodes in the neck. And really it's the frontline test for initial assessment of thyroid cancer preoperative management, and for looking for disease recurrence in the neck. CT or MRI of the neck is useful as an adjunct to ultrasound for evaluating the neck. It's more expensive and complicated, um, and so it should be um, used typically as the second line test, but it can be useful particularly to help surgeons plan surgery prior to, their, uh, prior to doing that. The CT of the chest is great for looking at the lungs for metastatic spread, uh, for looking for lung nodules that are common in thyroid cancer. Radio iodine imaging is sensitive for well-differentiated thyroid cancer, and it's great for planning radioactive iodine therapy. And FDG PET-CT is sensitive for poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. I see uh, some people have been uh, raising their hand in the chat. We're gonna uh, hold the uh, questions till the end, um, and we're, we're getting towards the end of the lecture, so I'll be with you soon on those questions. All right, so one obvious question that you may have is, well, what scan should I have done? Um, as I'm, I've talked about a lot of different imaging modalities, which one is the right one for me? It's not possible to answer this for every possible uh, patient scenario, but we're gonna go through some of the more common ones. 
Broadly speaking, methods that use I do not use ionizing radiations and are less expensive are great for the frontline testing. As I, and as I mentioned already, really ultrasound is kind of the king of thyroid cancer imaging. Um, more advanced imaging should be called into play for more high-risk scenarios, patients with high risk of recurrence, advanced disease, things like that. And it may also be useful for guiding treatment planning. So for example, CT or MRI is very useful for planning surgery. It can let them know, let surgeons know if the, the cancer is growing into the adjacent tissues and may make their surgery more difficult. Iodine-123 is a, a great type of imaging for planning radioactive iodine radioactive iodine treatment. Can we detect additional sites? Can we help it use it, use it to guide our dose properly? And FDG PET-CT can be useful for helping planning treatment for suspected aggressive uh, thyroid cancers. So one source that's useful for, you know, what is the best test for, for thyroid cancer or for any type of cancer imaging is the American College of Radiology or ACR. They have these nice appropriateness criteria that they release. These are um, they're very kind of straightforward and easy to understand. They put things into different categories, usually appropriate, maybe appropriate, usually not appropriate, and they assign them a, radio, a relative radiation level. So it's kind of nice and simple. You can, you know, look at the chart, uh, you know, which is, which is the best test for me. So here's an example, preoperative evaluation for differentiated thyroid cancer. So initial staging, you know, patient had a, you know, biopsy, found a thyroid cancer. What is the best test? Um, for the surgeon to plan their surgery. Now, as I mentioned already, that really the king here is ultrasound of the thyroid, the frontline test. Probably by the time the patient has the diagnosis, they've already got, had an ultrasound. Maybe they get another one before the surgery to get a best look at the tissues. CT of the neck is a good next step as well in some cases, particularly if it's quite advanced. If the, if the thyroid cancer is not that extensive, you probably don't need it, to be totally honest. But if it's... Um, if it's advanced, meaning there's palpable large masses or you know, any suggestion that the, the cancer is more widespread then CT neck would be next. And then really these other types, they, they start to be um, less appropriate in that setting. You don't need a whole body scan, you know, for example, prior to surgery, most likely. Now, how about after surgical resection? So early imaging in the, after the treatment of differentiated thyroid cancer, you know, patients had a surgical resection, what is, what is the next step? So again, kind of ultrasound of the thyroid, really the, the most appropriate um, next step in this situation. Um, iodine scanning, I would actually disagree with this a little bit personally. I think ultra iodine scan is, is a great next step if you're considering radioactive iodine treatment for patients. Patients with low risk disease may not need the whole body scan, but if you're going to uh, plan to do radioactive iodine treatment, I think a, a iodine whole body scan is appropriate before doing that. And then these other types of scans also, you know, maybe um, may be appropriate. And then other, other things, you know, PET scan, for example, the first thing after removing a well-differentiated thyroid cancer is probably not needed. Um, so for suspected recurrence, so this is, you know, a patient who's had the, the surgical resection, um, unfortunately, the thyroglobulin level is starting to rise. What do you do next? This is where it starts to get more complicated because that recurrence can be in any number of different sites. Again, ultrasound is really just a great test in the setting, but here now you get into more options like CT scanning or MRI of the neck. And then also this is definitely where the iodine whole body scan um, also comes into play. All right, I wanna make sure that we leave plenty of time for questions because I, I see that there's 17 of them in the chat. So I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here. But to summarize for imaging, key distinctions to consider are structural versus functional imaging. Um, ultrasound is a great frontline test for thyroid cancer. And you know, that, that is usually the first, first line of defense, uh, CT and MRI is useful for planning surgery and detecting metastatic spread. Uh, radio iodine imaging is very sensitive for well differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, FDG PET CT is great for de-differentiated thyroid cancer. And of course, um, for these, uh, do, definitely discuss your options uh, with your physician. I think uh, you know physicians enjoy uh, having patients with uh, who are well informed about their own treatment. Um, and with that, I will uh, conclude. I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and we can spend some time going through the questions. Oh, wonderful! Thank you so much, um, Dr. Flavel, for all of that great information. Um, and everybody for your patience um, with, we will, uh, Roselle and I are gonna do our best to um, help um, Dr. Flavel get through the questions. It's different when we're in person, I know. So we'll try to try to get to as many as we can. Um, um, I'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and start. Um, 
Uh, so the first question, um, and I'm going to read it so that others can, can hear the question. Um, both the low dose uh, RAI scans and the FDG PET CT scans have been coming clean for this patient, whereas the malignant lymph nodes, which are sub one centimeter in size, are being confirmed by neck ultrasound um, plus fine needle um, aspiration, I believe, over the last two years. Are there any other imaging techniques to detect malignancy in case of distant metastasis in the future, especially since ultrasound can only be done for the neck? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. And it's a nice example of the complementary roles of the different imaging. You know, as I mentioned, um, ultrasound is kind of the king of thyroid cancer imaging, and especially for these, these tiny little lymph nodes in the neck, uh, it's really just great for picking them up. It sounds like you, you've had a very good uh, and kind of comprehensive imaging evaluation, including a uh, whole body um, iodine scan and FDG PET scan. Um, you know, those are really kind of the standard of care. Um, I assume the, the, the PET CT would have included the lungs. So that would have been really kind of the main other sites of disease. But, uh, you know, I think most likely, it sounds like you've had a fairly comprehensive imaging evaluation and um, that your doctors are on top of it. So I, I would suggest continuing continuing surveillance of those, um, those uh, nodules in the neck with the ultrasound. And then, you know, if that, if the thyroid globulin is ri rising disproportionately, they could go back to CT or PET or something like that. Okay, the next, uh, whoops, lost my place. Uh, the next uh, question comes from Tony, uh, says my whole body scan showed RAI uptake in the sternum and clavicle. MRI findings stated, quote, likely reflect small metastases as it is very unusual to have false positive on I-131 scan within the bone, unquote. But another MRI by another facility thinks it's not, and it's degenerative uptake. My question is, why was there differing opinion between facilities? That is a great question. And I will say that there is definitely, um, you know, in the world of of imaging, we have um, that you will sometimes have differing opinions. Um, and I think this is, you know, this is a nice example of it. I'm, it's obviously I can't comment on your specific case, not having seen the imaging, but in some cases there may be uh, differences of opinion um, for different, uh, different um, from a different person reviewing the imaging. Some cases are very much a slam dunk and, you know, a hundred percent of radiologists would agree on it, but there are some cases that are sometimes in the middle and it's like, well, we're not totally sure about about what it is. Um, so um, I, I, I kind of reflect, I kind of tend to agree with the quote that with the MRI findings said that uh, likely reflects small metastases as unusual to have false positives on iodine 131 scan within the bone. I think that is a, that is a fairly true statement. It's if the uptake was really bright and intense, there aren't really that many things that are false positives um, for radioactive iodine scanning in the bones. So what that's worth. Okay. Um, the next couple questions here are from Jay. Um, do you regularly make comparisons with previous scans? In other words, do you look at the scans um, side by side or just at the previous reports? And can yeah. you make the clear difference between FDG PET and I-131 PET? Yes, absolutely. These are great questions. So yes, we always make comparisons with previous scans when they're available. Um, and that um, um, we have these kind of big monitors where we have them side by side. So typically we'll have, you know, the current scan up here and then the prior scan is right next to it. And we're just looking at them right next to each other. And we're going through it like, you know, side by side, measuring things, looking at the level of uptake, that kind of thing. So absolutely. And the other thing I would just say for, for the patients in the audience is please keep, if you're, especially if you're switching institutions, get copies of your imaging and have them uploaded because it makes all the difference in the world to have that prior imaging available. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, we'll have patients being transferred in from outside institutions. We have no prior imaging and it's a really complicated scan and we're just flying blind. So buy it, please get, you know, get discs of your imaging and have it uploaded. Um, so next question is, can you make clear the difference between FDG PET and iodine-131 PET? Okay, so good question. So uh, FDG PET is that looking for that glucose metabolism. So it's really that, that underlying abnormal sugar metabolism that I was talking about. And iodine-131 SPECT, which is, um, is actually looking at that iodine metabolism. Um, 
So broadly speaking, iodine SPECT picks up the more well-differentiated thyroid cancers and the PET um, picks up those kind of badly differentiated glucose hungry cancers. And this next question was um, in the chat and it initially asked about uh, medullary thyroid cancer and then it says, you somewhat already answered my question with the comment that MTC doesn't take up iodine. So can you comment on what techniques are better for medullary thyroid cancer? So that's a great question. So those, those structural imaging techniques that I mentioned, the ultrasound and CT scan are great for medullary thyroid cancer. Um, you know, particularly uh, the ultrasound of the neck, just great for following those little lymph nodes. And then, you know, CT scanning of the lungs, uh, quite useful. For medullary thyroid cancer, their functional imaging also plays a role. Uh, FDG PET scanning is commonly used. There's another one that's sometimes used for medullary thyroid cancer, which is called uh, dotatate PET scanning, um, because that it's, a, it's kind of a different targeting uh, agent uh, going after... Um, somatostatin receptors that are expressed particularly on medullary thyroid cancer. So that's another, another option, but really again, frontline is kind of the structural imaging modalities, ultrasound CT, and then PET, PET scanning is kind of like the kind of backup modality. Okay. Um, thank you. The next question from Jax is about MRI. You said that MRI does not use ionizing radiation, but if you add contrast to the MRI, does it then use ionizing radiation? What is the contrast? If you do not use the contrast, what percentage of readability do you lose on the average? Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So MRI does not use ionizing radiation. Uh, MRI of the neck particularly is commonly used with contrast and the, the type of contrast we use is called gadolinium. Um, and, um, the gadolinium is, has generally thought to be safe. There's a little bit of emerging data about that gadolinium can be deposited in, in tissues. We don't understand fully what that means, um, but something kind of the medical community is keeping its eye on. Um, and if you do not use the contrast, what percentage of the readability do you lose on average? I would, I would say in general for thyroid cancer, for MRI of the neck, it's better to do it with, with the contrast. I mean, maybe you know, you're, you're not, it's not worthless without the contrast, but it certainly is helpful. So maybe 50% of the readability or something like that. Uh, the next question is, um, does tracer dose uh, for uh, affect the sensitivity of a whole body scan to detect distant sites of disease? Yes. The, the answer to that is definitely yes. And so typically for, for radioactive iodine scanning and treatment, we do um, we typically do a pre-therapy scan often to help us plan the treatment, but then we also do a post-therapy scan and the post-therapy scan is used with, you know, and the reason why the post-therapy scan is useful because it has a much, much bigger dose. So say if you, you know, your pre-therapy scan is done with two millicuries, your post-therapy scan is done with, you know, 50 or hundred millicuries, that post-therapy scan is much more sensitive because you gave a higher tracer dose. Now, of course, you don't want to give too much radiation in general. So we're not, you know, we don't want to give toxic doses uh, to patients unnecessarily for a diagnostic scan, but for when we do give it for the whole body scan uh, for the treatment, then we, we like to do the imaging because it's more sensitive. Okay. Um, at what point is an ultrasound repeat warranted? If you were in doubt, the technician did a thorough enough job. We're talking about a papillary thyroid cancer and lymph node involvement post two neck dissections and 164 millicuries of RAI six months prior. Got it. Okay. So, um, so um, the, the, what you're describing is kind of a more complicated case, right? Two surgeries, radioactive iodine, not, not the most straightforward case. So certainly, um, you know, ultrasound is, is a great test to look for that, but it can be more complicated. And these are also cases where it's useful to be kind of following the trend of things. So like it's common for, for patients like you to have like little spots in the neck that are there and kind of follow them from scan to scan. So I think I think for you, it's, it would be important to have your, your scan, your ultrasounds done at a, you know, a, a, you know, a center that's doing a lot of um, ultrasounds and to have them done, you know, serially at the same location. And Beth asks, um, I run the Facebook group for metastatic papillary follicular patients that are RAI refractory. For those of us that are PET plus uh, with papillary, would this change our diagnosis to poorly differentiated? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, um, so 
so what you're talking about is kind of two di tumor de-differentiation where, you know, it's something that's it's something that started off as a well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer uh, or follicular cancer. It's lost its ability to concentrate radioactive iodine, and now it's kind of switched its metabolism over to that sugar type of metabolism. So in general, that, yes, unfortunately, that does correlate with, with tumor de-differentiation. De it's not perfect. It's not 100%. But, you know, I think most likely if you had a biopsy of one of those sites of disease, there's, you know, not a small chance that would be, you know, the, the, the histology would look quite different and, you know, might, might look more like a poorly differentiated cancer. Okay. Um, the next question from Candice. Um, um, I, I have numerous assumed um, PTC lung mets that took neither I-131 or PET. They are very small. Could they be too small to take up PET? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, yes, things that are small, typically we say less than, you know, five millimeters or one centimeter may be negative on the PET scan. Now, that being said, the CT characteristics can sometimes be so definitive that they can be, we can be absolutely definitive with their metastases, even if they're not positive on the PET scan. And Olga asks, what type of imaging is recommended for pediatric papillary thyroid cancer now? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, you know, in general, uh, for children, we're even more um, cautious about the use of, of radiation because uh, it's the general line of thinking is that, um, you know, children are more sensitive to radiation compared to adults. Absolutely. The, the frontline test uh, is ultrasound. Um, and uh, that should be used, uh, you know, as the front line in, in children. If the disease is more, more advanced and, and widespread, that's when you would, um, you know, use the radioactive iodine imaging and treatment and or CT scanning usually. Uh, MRI may also play a role. M depending on the age of the child, MRI can be tough because MRI, MRI scanners are loud and they have to sit still for a long time. So if it's a really young child, it can be difficult. But for a teenager or something like that, it's fine. Okay, um, and Katie's asking, is ultrasound useful af after thyroid cancer or after the thyroid has been removed for cancer? Is ultrasound useful still? Yeah, great question. Absolutely, ultrasound is useful after the thyroid has been removed for cancer. And it's useful for detecting recurrences and it's useful to get, as I said, like kind of serial ultrasounds. Typically, there'll always be like little spots in the neck after the thyroid gets removed, just be little bits of tissue that are left over. But the key thing is, if those spots start to grow scan to scan, that's when we're really concerned that it's a recurrence. And the next question is, can you comment on why patients with metastatic disease that are not surveilled with MRI or not surveilled with MRI instead of CT? I see this more in medullary, but not as often in non-medullary thyroid cancer. It's mm. a good question. Um, so the MRI is, is nice for looking at the neck in particular. So, so for serial surveillance imaging, you could do an MRI of the neck. Uh, it's also nice for the bones. So patients who have metastases in their bones, nice to look at them with MRI. It's better than CT scanning. CT scanning is, you know, definitively better for looking at the lungs. MRI is, you know, is essentially useless for looking at the lungs. So CT scanning needs to be used in that setting. Um, and it's, you see its use more in medullary, but not as often in non-medullary thyroid cancer. Um, I think both are reasonable choices in both, both medullary and non-medullary thyroid cancers, um, personally. So I, th I think those are both reasonable choices in, in those disease. Okay. I'm going to read another question. Um, I, I get um, diarrhea when I have contrast for my FDG PET scans, and I'm offered two bottles of barium contrast, but I only drink three quarters of one bottle. Should I try to drink more of the barium contrast, or is three quarters of one bottle good enough? Okay, so it sounds like you're getting um, oral contrast for your, your scans there, um, and it's causing some diarrhea for you. Um, the, uh, the use of oral contrast, uh, can you get away with doing less of it? Um, I'll tell you, we actually don't use oral contrast at all for our PET scans at at our institution, um, so I think that's that's somewhat uh, dependent on the, the on an institutional protocol uh, as to whether or not you could get away with doing less of it. I think if you use less of it, you get less of the intended effect, which is kind of distending the bowel and getting a better look at the bowel. Um, but you know, I'll just say we don't use 
oral contrast for for thyroid cancer PET scans at our institution. Ty asks, is there any news with tennis syndrome? T-E-N-I-S. Got it. So, so tennis refers to um, uh, th thyroid, elevated thyroglobulin with negative iodine scan. So that means the, you know, uh, this is, uh, these are patients who have the thyroglobulin level is going up indicating the thyroid cancer is coming back, but they have a radioiodine scan and it's negative. So the, the thinking here is usually is that these patients have radioiodine refractory disease. And um, these, this is a situation, actually one of the better situations to use a PET scan in thyroid cancer. Um, so that is, you know, is a good alternative in that setting um, because, because as I mentioned, kind of, it can have that metabolic switch from the iodine to the glucose. So um, often the, a nice, a nice option for a patient who has tennis syndrome is to undergo a PET scan because sometimes it can pick things up. Okay. Um... Next question is, can you comment on whole body MRI like Pernuvo? Got it. So, uh, so whole body MRI is, um, is a technique and there's various versions of this out there. Whole body MRI is actually used more in Europe compared to in the United States. So I don't know if you're, maybe you're calling from Europe, um, but um, it's, uh, um, it's something that's not used all that widely. It's a nice technology for looking in terms of thyroid, I haven't heard that much about it in thyroid cancer, to be totally honest. I think it would be useful potentially for looking at, you know, bone metastases and things like that. So I, I think it could potentially have some value, but I think this is, I would characterize that as a little bit experimental, probably in the use of thyroid cancer, not really in the main standard of care. The next question is from Kara. Uh, what symptoms would you suggest that the cancer is more widespread in papillary thyroid cancer? Good question. I mean, most likely asymptomatic, realistically, you know, it takes, it takes really typically a pretty good amount of, of cancer before patients start becoming really symptomatic from it. The ones, you know, the most common sites of metastases for papillary thyroid cancer, um, you know, what you might feel is like a lump in the neck or something like that would be something. Um, if the cancer became widespread in the lungs, you might feel shortness of breath. Or if it became, you know, if it spread to somewhere in the bones and you had a painful bone metastasis, you might feel like a focal bone pain or something like that. Okay. Um, I know we have just about six minutes left, so we'll try to get through uh, a few more questions. Um, uh, a question from Kara is, how much radioactive iodine can one receive in their lifetime? Great question. Uh, there's no real cap on this, you know. Typically we, you know, kind of rule sort of people start getting more concerned about uh, risks of further side effects. If you start getting above um, kind of a cumulative dose of uh, either a thousand millicuries or 600 millicuries, that the line of thinking is that as you start getting up into those levels that um, there's increased risk of secondary malignancies and or uh, pulmonary fibrosis, um, things like that. Um, so uh, there's no real rule about this, but generally once we start reaching those higher, higher levels, that's when we start thinking about alternatives. And the next question comes from Beth. Uh, what type of imaging scans would you recommend for bone tumors, bone mets that are RAI non-AVID that have genetic mutations like ATM that make them radio sens sensitive? Um, so you... Uh... So your main options for, for surveilling uh, bone metastases would be maybe an MRI scan. If it's localized to a certain part of the body, you could follow them with serial, you know, say if it was a bone metastasis in your pelvis, you'd get serial, uh, serial MRI scans. And then, but, uh, you know, PET scanning would also be a good one because it can kind of look at the whole body at once. And in terms of the, you know, having a tumor that, un unless you have, unless you have a germline mutation in ATM, which is unusual, um, that's, uh, that that would that's a genetic cancer syndrome if it's just the cancer itself that has the atm mutation it's probably not that bad to have uh, you know low dose of radiation from a pet scan or something okay next question is a specific case from tall um elevated tg of 50 to 150 close to zero tsh no visible an i131 and fdg pet scans three to four years of those tests and patient is currently 17 years old. Okay, got it. 
Um, yeah, so you sound like negative PET, negative iodine scan, uh, currently 17 years old, a pretty elevated TG number. I, I'd assume maybe that's a, a stimulated TG or if that's a baseline TG, it's pretty high. Um, so this is kind of that thyroglobulin, that tennis syndrome that we were talking about where you have an elevated uh, thyroglobulin and you're not finding it. You know, I think the best thing, it sounds like you're getting some good imaging tests. The other thing might be, you know, ultrasounds of the neck, just keeping kind of a close eye on things um, and just kind of following the trends of things. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the TG is certainly is, it's, you know, it's an important number, but at the end of the day, it's just a number. So, you know, if you can't find anything on the scan, uh, it, it may not necessarily be worth going after aggressive treatments. And Joel asks, uh, when looking for remote metastases, when you don't know where it is, what modality would be most appropriate? Okay, that's a good question. So we uh, we can that's one where you can use uh, you know PET scan might be a good one. A PET scan is a whole body is a whole body type of scan or a radio iodine scan. Uh, those look at the whole body at once. Um, and um, CT scanning is another alternative in that setting. Okay, I'm going to ask um, probably uh, one more question here, um, and then we'll probably have to wrap up. But um, this is a question about osteoporosis, which I know a lot of people who have long-term um, treatment for thyroid cancer are at risk of developing. So the question is for um, Forteo, which is a drug for osteoporosis, has a caution about using it if you have ever had radiation. I had 104 millicuries of I-131 and two tracer doses for gamma camera scans approximately 19 years ago. Does I uh, does the 131 RAA, RAI count as the type of radiation that drugs like Forteo talk about, or do they just forget about this type of radiation and it should be okay? That is a good question. I, I'll say I don't know the answer to that. Um, my best guess is that they, it specifically refers to external beam radiation, which is, you know, is a high dose, high localized dose of radioactive or high of radiation. Um, I, I would have, yeah, I don't know the answer, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Thank you. Um, I think we are just about out of time. We did a good job. Hopefully we got most of your questions answered. I just want to make sure I take this time to, to thank Dr. Flavel for coming today, sharing all this great information with us and answering all of um, your questions. Um, so thank you so much, um, Dr. Flavel and to Roselle for helping uh, facilitate this session. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoyed it and, and uh, thrilled to see all the questions and, and interest from the member of the audience. Wonderful. Well, take care, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of the day.